Welcome to a new era in DC history when the absolute universe, fueled by dark side energy, gives rise to a new yet familiar hero. Can the emergence of Gotham City's latest vigilante stop a hyper-violent gang from terrorizing the city? Let's find out in Absolute Batman number 1 from DC Comics. See you in 3. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Absolute Batman number 1. Let's not mince words. Absolute Batman number 1 is an engaging, gripping, sometimes thrilling, and thoroughly entertaining comic. Scott Snyder's reimagined take on the Batman legend will likely be a crowd pleaser and make huge sales through the first few issues. But, uh, well, well, you know what, let's get to the rest of the review and we can talk about what's not so great. Absolute Batman number 1 begins with Alfred Pennyworth returning to Gotham City after a multi-year absence at the behest of his employers. This Alfred is no stodgy British butler, but a world-class black ops specialist sent to assess criminal organizations and eliminate targets with extreme prejudice. Alfred grudgingly accepts the reassignment away from his current mission and sets up in Gotham to gather intel on the hyper-violent gang known as the Party Animals and the reports of a rumored new vigilante on the scene. Writer Scott Snyder takes readers through the world building of absolute Gotham City through the eyes and narration of Alfred Pennyworth through most of the issue. Designed as a cross between the film versions of Alfred from the TV show Gotham and the Batman movie from 2022, and a visual sort of alpha male version of Ra's al Ghul, this Alfred is not anyone you'd want to mess with. He's cunning, experienced, and deadly. In short, absolute Alfred is a badass. Elsewhere, we meet absolute Bruce Wayne, a hulking brute of a man training at Croc's gym. We learn through his brief dialogue with his acquaintances, including the boxing gym's owner, Waylon Jones, that the city is under siege by criminal elements. And there's a town hall meeting tonight to address the city's woes. Waylon encourages Bruce to get out more with his friends like he used to, or at least come to the town hall meeting to add his voice to the throngs of citizens looking for help. Bruce abruptly declines. We also learn through the dialogue and a group picture on the wall that Bruce and Waylon's friends are named Ozzy, Selena, Harvey, and Edward, which should be familiar characters to anybody who knows the Batman mythology. You know, so far, so good. Absolute Bruce Wayne certainly has the right presence and stoic personality that makes him read as Bruce Wayne. Plus, Snyder quickly rattles off a stream of name drops to imply all the familiar characters exist in this universe, albeit not in the same form you might remember. There's a Selina Kyle, there is an Oswald Cobblepot, and all the rest. Although, from the looks of it, they're not quite criminals yet, just peers of Bruce Wayne. Later, we meet the big bad of this first arc, Roman Sionis, also known as Black Mask. Roman meets with the heads of the local mafia families, including Falcone and Maroni, to discuss the party animal's gang problem. It's clear Roman is somehow connected to or sponsoring the party animal's actions, so Falcone and Maroni deliver an ultimatum for Roman to leave town. The requests are heard and quite easily dismissed. There's really not much to say about this classic meeting of head-butting mob leaders. It's pretty standard stuff for a Batman comic, except for one twist. Roman's mask and the masks of his family, colleagues, and party animal gang members are shaped from an assortment of animal skulls instead of the classic human skull that we're used to seeing. And the masks have some form of circuitry embedded within for some unknown reason or purpose. As a guess, you could say that maybe the absolute version of Black Mask is a hybrid between Black Mask and maybe Mad Hatter. Maybe there's some kind of mind control going on, not quite sure. So we'll see how that plays out in future issues. The issue then cuts to the town hall meeting we were heard referenced earlier. Mayor Jim Gordon addresses the attendees with a message of calm and patience, but it's just a little too, little too late. Unfortunately, playing by the rules isn't proving effective against the party animals gang. Outside, Alfred watches the scene from a nearby rooftop with orders not to engage if anything happens, unless a new player that was rumored earlier arrives on the scene and creates a problem for the party animals as they engage the town hall meeting. Suddenly, a small army of armed party animals storms the building steps and barges into the meeting with guns ablazing. Alfred is ordered not to interfere. Suddenly, the new player who we heard rumored about arrives to put down the attack. I won't go into much detail about Absolute Batman's first appearance except to say it's the kind of brutal, hard-hitting, cool action we haven't seen from DC in quite a lot of time. For anyone who's seen the redesign, Absolute Batman is more bat-like and animalistic with his bat whip cape thingy things, stilts, I don't know what you call it, and he uses his tools with great effectiveness. Also, the chest symbol does come off as an axe, 
he does use his axe in the first fight and he uses it to chop off the hand of an armed gang member so he's not afraid of getting gory and a little bit gruesome as an outcome of the fight we have to address the big question in the room does absolute batman kill the answer according to the story that's written and the outcome of this big battle especially according to how the art is presented the answer is maybe alfred notes how batman uses knives and throwing blades to harm his opponents with surgical precision to avoid major arteries however the scene ends with batman setting off an explosion that very likely killed several people although a death toll isn't necessarily confirmed or stated Snyder goes out of his way through multiple scenes and multiple bits of narration dialogue to infer Batman doesn't kill, but the art as shown says something different. After the chaos subsides, Alfred descends from his perch and confronts Batman. Alfred believes he sized up Batman well enough to get the drop on him, but Batman outmaneuvers and disarms Alfred in a flash before leaving. Either by flying off or grappling or claw climbing or something, he just sort of goes up into the air, it doesn't really show exactly how he does it. What follows is a montage of scenes narrated by Alfred where he cycles through his research to deduce Batman's real identity, where he's located, details about his personal life, and the path he followed to become Batman. Through that montage, as the scene comes to a close, we learn the status of Bruce's parents, how and where he trained, and the lengths he went to to become the absolute Cape Crusader. The issue ends with a bat roost, we'll call it, it's not exactly a cave trading one gadget for another, and a peek at the familiar character Alfred was tracking before he was reassigned to Gotham City, and it's another character who you should be familiar with. All right, let's talk about the positives and the negatives, starting with what's great about Absolute Batman number one. From start to finish, Scott Snyder captures the vibe of a hard-hitting, dramatically intense Batman comic. Despite the reworked aesthetics, the heart and voice of the characters still feel familiar and authentic. Plus, the rework of Batman's costume looks much cooler in action, which should be a lesson to everyone to withhold judgment until you get the full context. I don't think the preview images and the concept drawings did this comic any favors. It looks much better on the page than it does in concept. All right, let's switch over to the negatives and what's not great about Absolute Batman number one. I know I'm risking <laughs> sounding like an old man yelling at clouds, but here's the deal. Absolute Batman and the world he occupies are technically different but they're just not different enough to feel like anything more than Elseworlds light. I'll give you some examples. Giving Alfred a Black Ops background isn't new. We saw that in multiple incarnations recently from the Gotham TV show to the Batman film from 2022. That's not new. Bruce Wayne becoming Batman because he's motivated by the death of a loved one is also, again, nothing new. Creating a fancy bat theme set of gadgets is also, again, nothing new and a Gotham City infested with gangsters and colorful villains that have different themes and different kind of weird, odd quirks. Again, it's nothing new. A lot of it is tweaked and aesthetically adjusted, but thematically, they're all very, very similar to what you're already familiar with. Now, yes, yes, sure, sure. There are amalgams and there are tweaks and there are adjustments to make each one of these characters different from the incarnation that's in the mainline DC universe but they're all mild variations. If you think about Elseworlds and what that imprint has in your mind, compare it to, say, Red Sun or Gotham by Gaslight. This doesn't even come close to an Elseworlds story. Further, this world is supposed to be formed from dark side energy, and we saw that in the conclusion of Absolute Power. But all the telltale signs of dark side's influence, such as reddish skies and omega symbols everywhere, which is exactly what we saw at the end of the DC All-In Special Number 1, are nowhere to be found. So the cohesion between the all-in initiative and the absolute titles is already a little bit off or just plain missing. Now just to be clear, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, I'm not trying to rain on DC's parade. This is a thoroughly enjoyable comic, but by the end of it, you'll sort of be left wondering if it's different enough to be considered an Elseworlds universe or not. And if not, why not just give the main Batman title back to Scott Snyder? I mean, Chip Zdarsky's ruined it. I mean, he's just done a terrible job. So I'd rather Scott Snyder take it than keep it with Zdarsky. Why did they go this direction? I'm not sure. And to be honest, I don't think anybody will ever know why. Let's switch gears and talk about the art for a second. I'll be honest and say I had my doubts due to the overly bulky look of Batman on the covers and the promotion materials but the massive body with a tiny, tiny head is not as noticeable in Nick Dragota's powerful dynamic art as it's presented within the internal pages. When Batman appears for the fight at the town hall meeting, Dragota steals the show with a Batman who is a force to be reckoned with, 
Again, the weird cape stilt thingies look a lot better in context and in action than the concept drawings would suggest. So it looks weird, or at least the concept art looks weird, but when you see it in action, it looks a heck of a lot better. Final thoughts, what do we think about Absolute Batman number one? It's a banger of a first issue that introduces readers to a new-ish kind of Batman, Alfred and Gotham City. Scott Snyder's knack for hard-hitting action and drama is on full display, and Nick Dragota's art sings, especially during the big fight. That said, Absolute Batman is almost a little too similar to the regular Batman titles, so you may sort of find yourself wondering why creating an alternate version was necessary in the first place. Therefore, Absolute Batman earns a 9 out of 10. If you had high expectations for this title, there's a good chance your expectations will be met. But what do you think? Where does Absolute Batman sit on your must-have scale? Leave a thumbs up if you found this review helpful, and drop a comment below with your hopes and dreams for Absolute Superman and Absolute Wonder Woman, which will be coming up in a few weeks. Also, remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review, check out the varying covers and preview pages, and buy this comic to help support the channel, your support is greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for joining, and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.